Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, limits, uh, the limits law to be a little bit more exact. Um, so uh, this is going to be, I guess, the second portion of the limit set that we're going to be doing for calculus. Uh, now here uh, we have the following limit laws that uh, we are going to apply to our problems. Uh, you know, these are pretty basic or very trivial for the most part for a lot of people, but it's worth talking about just in case because uh, you're going to need them for uh, when you're doing the algebra a little bit later on. Um, so here, the first part, uh, this one is actually a theorem uh, that uh, we kind of talked about in the last section, uh, which basically says that if a limit is going to exist, uh, then the limit from coming from the left has to be the same as the limit coming from the right. So that means that, uh, for example, uh, if your limit is supposedly going to be equal to 2, uh, then the limit coming from the left has to equal to 2, uh, just as the same as the limit from the right has to equal to 2 as well. So this right here is actually very important, and we will see that in use in a little bit. Now, uh, for the other limit laws, uh, these are the ones that, again, you know, it seems very trivial for the most part, but again, it's worth mentioning then. Uh, so to begin with, uh, we first by say, uh, we first start by saying that if the limit of f of x uh, for x approaching towards a and limit as x approaches towards a for g of x exists, uh, then the following limit laws exist. Uh, if you take any, t for the first one, um, if you take any two functions and you add or subtract them and then you apply the limits, uh, you can break that into two parts. That is to say, find the limit of the first function plus the f or minus find the limit of the second function. For the second limit law, uh, this is going to be a product uh, constant, uh, which means that if you take the limit as x approaches towards a of a constant multiplied by a function, you can take that constant and multiply by the limit of the function just by itself, by just taking it out. Limit law number three says that if you take any two functions and you multiply together and you're trying to find a limit, you can then find the limit of each one individually and then also multiply them out uh, after you find the limit. And finally, limit law number four says that if you're trying to find a limit as x approaches towards a of a quotient function, the uh, that is going to be the same thing as taking the limit of just the numerator divided by the lim limit of the denominator, provided that the limit of the denominator cannot equal to zero. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about a formal definition here uh, that we will be using quite a bit a little bit later on. Uh, the following is the definition for the word continuous. Uh, so what it means for the word to be continuous is the following. A function f is to be continuous at a single point we call x is equal to a if the limit at f of x is equal to f of a. And right underneath that graph is just basically going to be your illustration. So meaning uh, the following. Let's say that you have a graph and you have the x value at a. If the limit coming from the left is the same as the limit coming from the right, and that limit is the same thing as just plugging it into the equation, then that means that graph is going to be continuous. The alternative to this is if your limit coming from the left and the limit coming from the right is the same thing, but when you plug it in, you have an open circle or a removable discontinuity there. So you can see that if I replace that filled in dotted circle with a removable discontinuity, then therefore that x equals to a, it is not considered continuous. So that means, once again, that if you try to find a limit of a function at a, at a certain point x is equal to a, uh, it is considered continuous if that same answer is as if you plug in just f of a itself. Okay. Uh, last limit law that we want to talk about is a um, kind of like, I guess, a uh, the use of the limit. Uh, sorry, it's basically the use of this uh, definition of continuous from previously right above it. So here in number five, the very last limit law in this case is that the limit as x approaches towards a of a composite function f of g of x is equal to f of the limit as x approaches towards a of g of x. So basically what that means is that you can actually take the limit as x approaches towards a and plug it inside of the composite function, solving for that first, and then afterward take the f of whatever that answer is as the result. Now, this is assuming that f is continuous as x is equal to c, where c is supposed to be equal to the limit of that. 
And again, for the most part, this seems very uh, direct, but uh, that is going to be something that is not going to be as easy as we'll see in an example uh, uh, up ahead. So uh, the last part, this is what we call the direct substitution property. And this one is actually something that we all take for granted for when we do limit problems. Uh, this is what it says. If f is a polynomial or a rational function and at x equals to a is in the domain of f, then the limit as x approaches towards uh, a of f of x is equal to f of a. So this essentially is saying that, hey, if you have a function f, which is a polynomial or a rational function, you can just directly plug in x is equal to a into the equation and then afterwards uh, solve for what the limit is, or actually not the equation, but into the expression. This is not only for polynomials or rational functions. This can also be applied to any continuous function where the domain is all real numbers. So for example, if f of x is, let's say, a trig function like, say, sine of x or cosine of x, where x can be any real numbers for the domain, uh, or if f of x is an exponential function, then this actually also works out. So you can directly just go ahead and plug it in. So let's now look at some of the uh, numerical examples uh, where we apply some of these uh, limit laws then. So the first one over here says evaluate the limit as x approaches towards uh, the square root of 2 uh, for this expression over here on the right. So uh, what we said in the last time is that uh, the very first thing that we always try to do is try to plug in the limit as x approaches towards uh, square root of 2. So basically using direct substitution. Now, looking at the expression on the right-hand side, you'll notice that this is a polynomial multiplied by another polynomial. So therefore, it is a polynomial. So what that means is we can apply this direct substitution thing. And in fact, that's what we always should try to do first, uh, unless you know something funky happens afterwards. So let's go ahead and plug in x is equals to square root of 2. So we will get the square root of 2 quantity squared plus 5 multiply by the square root of 2, multiply by the square root of 2, plus 1. So keep on moving on. Uh, the left-hand side, the factor over there, you're going to get 2 plus 5, and then multiply by the other factor, which looks like it's going to be 2 plus 1. So uh, multiplying all this out, well, adding everything in between, that's going to be 7 multiplied by 3, so the answer is equal to 21. So that's going to be my limit then. Now, uh, in the second case right here, um, I want to evaluate the following limit then. Uh, again, just like the same as before, we're going to go ahead and just plug in x equals to 9 first just to see what it happens. If I do so, we will get 9 multiplied by the square root of 9 minus 3, all divided by 9 minus 9. Now, if I keep cleaning it up, you're going to get 9 multiplied by, uh, looks like it's going to be 3 minus 3, and the bottom looks like it's going to be 0, so it's 9 times 0 over 0. And be very careful, that actually does not cancel out and give you 9 as a result. That is actually a faux pas in uh, algebra. Um, instead, remembering that if you have 0 over 0, then that's where the removable discontinuity comes into play. And uh, that means that I need to most likely factor something out from both top and bottom in order to figure out what this limit is, in order to figure out what the removable discontinuity at that limit. So uh, looking at this problem now, uh, we can't use direct substitution, uh, but instead, let's go ahead and play around this algebraically. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see, but uh, if you look at the top part, you'll see that this guy right here, the square root of x minus 3, that's a problem. And the bottom part, the x minus 9, is also a problem. Uh, but look a little bit closely, uh, you'll see that uh, the top part, that is a, an example of a minus b as a composite uh, function. And then, uh, sorry, a, a composite factor. Uh, were as, I'm sorry, not a composite, a, a conjugate factor of a minus b, whereas the bottom part, that is the, uh, the conjugate uh, a squared minus b squared, uh, when you multiply everything out, getting a difference of square. So what that means is uh, the bottom part, I can actually uh, factor that into uh, a plus b multiplied by a minus b. So if we do so, here's what you get then. The limit as x approaches towards 9, the top part, x times the square root of x minus 3, 
the bottom part, x minus 9, remember, we are going to look at that as a difference of square. So one part will be the square root of x minus 3. The other part will be the square root of x plus 3. And right there, we can now see that the bottom part, the part that is problematic, is really the square root of x minus 3. Because then, if you cancel both top and bottom by that factor, you're going to get rid of that 0 over 0 that we got earlier. So cleaning it up a little bit more, we get now limit as x approaches towards 9 of x divided by the square root of x plus 3. And now we can go ahead and use direct substitution then. So 9 divided by the square root of 9 plus 3. So 9 divided by looks like 3 plus 3. So that gives you 9 over 6. So the answer is equal to 3 over 2.